Good evening, everybody. This is a regular meeting of the City of Milton Planning Commission. I am Sumit Shah, Chairperson. This is a seven-member commission appointed by the City of Milton Mayor and City Council, created for the purpose of holding public hearings and making recommendations on rezoning, use permits, concurrent variance applications, comprehensive land use plan and plan map, and other related plans, and amendments to the zoning ordinance. I'd like to go ahead and introduce our board members. Uh, to my left, we have Fred Edwards, Kurt Nolte, again, I'm Sumit Shah, Ron Gilbert, and Marty Locke, and Jan Jacobus. And missing today is Zach Middlebrooks. The petitions will be heard in the sequence listed on the posted agenda. I would like to acquaint you with some of the rules and procedures conducting this meeting. The applicant and all those speaking in support of an application will be allowed a total of 10 minutes to present the petition. The applicant may choose to save some of the time for a rebuttal following the presentation by the opposition. The opposition will be allowed a total of 10 minutes to present its position. If time remains, the opposition will be allowed to rebut. Since the burden of proof is upon the applicant, the applicant will be allowed to make closing remarks, provided time remains with the allotted time. The staff of the Community Development Department will be keeping track of time and will inform you periodically of the remaining time for your presentation. Each speaker must fill out a speaker card before speaking and leave it with a staff member of the Community Development Department. All speakers will identify themselves by name, address, and organization, if applicable, before beginning their presentation. When an opponent of a rezoning action has made within two years immediately preceding the filing of the rezoning action being opposed, campaign contributions aggregating $250 or more to a local government official of the local government which will consider the application, it shall be the duty of the opponent to file a disclosure with the governing authority of the respective local government at least five days prior to the planning commission meeting. A violation of the relevant state statute constitutes a misdemeanor. Therefore, if you have contributed $250 or more to a council member and you have not filed a disclosure prior to the Planning Commission meeting, the city attorney strongly suggests that you have someone else speak for your point of view. Each application has been properly filed with the Department of Community Development. Signs have been posted on each site. The matter has been advertised and the notices have been mailed to property owners affected by this zoning as required by the Milton Zoning Ordinance. The Planning Commission's recommendation will be forwarded to the City of Milton Mayor and City Council for final disposition in approximately five weeks on the first Monday of each month at 6 p.m. in the Council Chambers. The Community Development Department has reviewed each application in conjunction with various agencies and departments, both internal and external to the City. Staff's recommendations, findings, and conclusions are here before us in written form, which has been made available to all petitioners and to the public. Demonstration of any sort within the chamber is prohibited, so please refrain from any applause, dialogue with the person speaking, or outburst. Please turn off all cell phones or place them on silent. All remarks will be addressed by the Planning Commission. Please show the same respect to the person speaking that you will expect to receive yourself. In addition, the applicant shall not submit material to the Planning Commission during the meeting unless requested to do so by the Commission. All material that you wish to be reviewed by the Commission in consideration of your application should be submitted to the staff of the Community Development Department to be included in the normal distribution of packages to the Commission. Finally, to the applicant, if your petition is deferred in accordance with the Milton Zoning Ordinance, you are required to update or obtain a new sign for reposting. Failure to update or repost will result in further delay. There are no exceptions. also like to welcome everybody to tonight's Planning Commission meeting if you are attending virtually via Zoom. There are a few guidelines I would like to mention. Everyone is muted and your videos are turned off by default to minimize any disruptions. If you would like to make a comment during the public hearing portions of this meeting, please raise your hand by clicking on the icon labeled participants at the bottom of your screen and then click the button labeled raise hand. If you are calling into the meeting on a phone, you can raise your hand by pressing star nine on your keypad. 
Once the moderator calls your name, please unmute yourself by clicking on the microphone button on the bottom of your screen or by pressing star six on your phone. At this time, I'd like to go ahead and call for any public comment. Do we have any, Robin? No. Okay. All right, then seeing no public comment, we'll move on to the next uh, item on the agenda, which is the approval of the February uh, Planning Commission Action Minutes. Any discussion about the February 24th Action Minutes? Move we accept the uh, Wednesday, February 24th, uh, 2021 Planning Commission meeting. We, have, I we have a motion to accept the February 24th Planning Commission meeting and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Anybody opposed? That passes. Was it Ron who made the second? Ron okay. made the second, yeah. Thank Fred you. made the first. Okay. Uh, next item on the agenda is uh, RZ21-04, VC21-02. Robin? So, inning. Okay, I got it. Yeah. Good evening um, to everyone. We have one item before you for rezoning um, as RZ21 04, VC21 02, 13555 Black Morrow Lane. Uh, the request is to rezone from CUP, Community Unit Plan, to AG1. Um, uh, the applicant would like to build a single-family residence and allow the existing structure um, to be in the front yard. Um, this is a density of 0.092 acres, unit per acre. There's a total of 10.8 acres on the property. Um, this is a location map, um, and it is within the subdivision of Boxwood Estates, right here, and... Uh, Providence Plantation comes out this direction, and then Providence comes around to the north-south direction. Again, this is the current zoning map. This green is the CUP portion of the subdivision, and all this other is AG1. And this to the east is an R2 that comes out onto, um, I believe, Doris Road. The applicant, Mr. Uh, Rosenberger, is requesting to farm the land with various types of crops, including a vineyard, and to produce wine. Um, a winery is only permitted by right within the AG1 zoning district. Um, in order to be licensed as a winery by the state, a designation of AG1 is needed. Um, the subject site contains 10.8 acres, and as I mentioned before, it's located within Boxwood Estate subdivision. And that subdivision contains a total of 10 lots that vary in size from 2.1 acres to 11.77. The site is located within the AEE um, designation of the 2035 comprehensive plan map. And then here you have it right here is the AEE and then low density residential, which is typically platted subdivisions. So. This is an, enlar an enlarged um, view of the uh, lot. Um, right here you have the cul-de-sac of Black Marl. Um, the yellow line is the outline of the site that's in uh, for rezoning. Uh, this is the existing structure barn, and then this is the proposed uh, new house 
uh, for the applicant. Okay. In regards to public participation um, on February 23rd, uh, there was no community members present at City Hall or via Zoom. Uh, the applicant held uh, the required public participation meeting on March 12th, and no community members were present at that meeting location or via Zoom, which he had it at his property. Um, at the Design Review Board, um, the courtesy review comments on March 2nd states, um, one, uh, provides support letters from all property owners within Boxwood Estates, two, recommended to rezone all the lots in Boxwood Estates to AG1, and finally recommended approval for the uh, rezoning and concurrent variance. In regards to the site plan analysis, this is a grid of all the different development standards that are required within the AG1 zoning district. I won't bore you with all the details, but um, it, the most important part is to look to the right. Does it meet the requirements? And all of them do, with um, exception to minimum access accessory structure requirements, um, stating that may be located in the rear or side yards, but not shall be but shall not be located within a minimum yard. And so I'll be discussing that concurrent variance for the existing barn for when he builds a new structure, a new house. Um, the applicant is requesting this concurrent variance to allow the barn, which also contains a small apartment, to be in front of the new single family residence. The following four variance considerations are discussed below regarding the request. Just. Um, uh, some pictures to give you an idea of what's out there. This is the existing barn. Um, and then this is a elevation of the existing barn. And you can see the house that's a bit in behind it, tucked behind it, where the applicant is proposing to place it. Uh, number one, relief if granted would not offend the spirit or intent of the zoning. The barn was originally constructed to house animals on the subject site. At that time, a primary house was not contemplated for the property. The existing structure currently meets the minimum standards for the AG1 zoning district, and based on the shape of the property being narrow in the front, a new single-family residence would be difficult to place in front of the existing structure. The applicant has demonstrated that the new single-family residence will blend in with the existing structure and therefore does not offend the spirit or intent of the zoning ordinance. Uh, the second consideration for the variance is there are such extraordinary and exceptional situations or conditions pertaining to the particular piece of property that the literal or strict application of the zoning ordinance would create an unnecessary hardship due to size, shape, or topography or other extraordinary and exceptional situations or conditions not caused by the variance applicant. Based on the shape of the property, the placement of the new single-family residence in front of the existing structure um, would not, uh, uh, would create an unnecessary hardship. Uh, number three, relief if granted would not cause a substantial detriment to the public good and surrounding properties. Staff notes that the existing structure had been used to house animals, but the applicant has chosen not to use it any longer in that capacity. Hence the need for this concurrent variance. The structure does have an appearance of a barn that houses animals and to allow it to be in front of the proposed single family residence, the front yard, would not cause a substantial detriment to the public good and surrounding properties. And lastly, the public safety, health, and welfare are secured and that substantial justice is done. The request to allow the existing structure to be in the front yard when the proposed single family residence is constructed ensures that the public health, safety, and welfare are secured and that substantial justice is done. Therefore, staff recommends BC 21-02 be approved conditional. In regards to the request for the rezoning, we look at uh, several standards of review. Um, the proposed rezoning of one lot to construct a single family residence and to be able to grow various types of crops, including grapes, to produce wine without customers coming onto the property is consistent with adjacent and nearby properties zoned AG1 to the north, further to the west, south, and southeast. It is staff's opinion that the proposed use is suitable with adjacent and nearby developments and zoning if approved with staff's recommended conditions. Secondly, 
used as a winery open to the public could have an adverse effect on the adjacent properties. Staff recommends that a condition be required to prohibit the property to be utilized as a winery where there are customers coming onto the property to taste, purchase the wine. This is because the property is located within a plotted subdivision and to access the subject site, um, one is required to drive through the Providence Plantation subdivision on a private road. Let me just clarify, Providence Plantation is not a private road, but once you enter Boxwood Estates, that is a private street. This condition will eliminate, quote unquote, commercial type traffic into the subdivision, but at the same time permit um, it to legitimately propagate a vineyard for production of wine. If approved with the above requirement, the proposed use is consistent with nearby properties and will not adversely affect existing use or usability of the adjacent properties described above. Number three, the subject site may have a reasonable use as currently zoned CUP. Four, staff does not anticipate a significant impact on public services or utilities. The number of students attending Fulton County schools were already accounted for when the rezoning for CUP was approved in 1996. The subdivision is already developed and the proposed rezoning will not have a negative impact on the existing streets, transportation facilities, or utilities if the recommended conditions are approved. Five, um, as stated earlier, um, the 2035 City of Milton Conference of Plan um, designates this area as agricultural, equestrian, and estate residential. And the proposed use is a single family resident and farm at 0.092 units per acre. The proposed AG1 zoning district uh, conforms to the suggested policies and intent of the comprehensive plan if developed with the recommended conditions to limit the activity on the property. The proposed AG1 allows for the property to operate a winery where um, uh, the applicant intends to plant grapes and other crops and can sell the wine per the state of Georgia farm winery regulations. In addition, adjacent and nearby properties are zoned AG1 as well as operate agricultural uses. The proposed use will not be environmentally adverse to the natural resources, environment, and citizens if developed with the recommended conditions. So in conclusion, if approved with the recommended conditions, staff recommends that the requested rezoning to AG1 RZ21-04 be approved conditional and the concurrent variance be approved as well. In regards to the recommended conditions, um, I'll just go through that. Um, number one, to the owner agreement to restrict the reuse of the property as follows, a single family detached dwelling and accessory uses and structures, no more than one dwelling unit at a maximum of 0.092 unit per acre, whichever is less, based on the total acreage zone. Um, a winery, but excluding customers coming onto the property to taste, purchase the wine. D, uses pursuant to section 64.415, use and regulations of the AG zoning district, agricultural district. Um, this is, uh, just as a side note, this was included um, because when we excluded um, uh, the ability to have people come onto the property, we wanted to make sure that the other appropriate uses for AG1 were allowed. As well as E, uses allowed by administrative use permit or use permit pursuant to Article 9 of uh, Chapter 64. So basically at the beginning of the AG1 zoning district standards, it, it says um, you have to go to Article 9 to look at the various use permits that may be available to the AG1 district. So we didn't want to exclude him for whether it was administrative or whether it's for um, a regular use permit. So um, that was those recommended conditions. And then basically the next condition is uh, compliance with the site plan received on January 28th, 2021. And then number three, um, this is the request for variance to the owner's agreement to the following site development considerations to allow the existing structure to be located in the front yard. And with that, I'm open to whatever questions you may have. One, one question. Um, you specifically exclude customers coming to purchase or taste wine. Um, is it the intent, to your knowledge, is it the intent of the applicant to turn this into an event space? 
I'm sorry, to what? Turned it into an event space of any, any type where he would be hosting, he or she would be hosting concerts of any kind. So you can ask the applicant. The intent is to, you know, to confirm, but this intent is to operate a winery. But many by right wineries um, allow customers to come to the site, um, you know, to taste and to purchase, um, uh, come to the site or the farm uh, to purchase it. So you will have to. Um, but you're excluding. I can't. I can't address whether what his future intentions are. This is only but, for. But you're excluding that as a possible the possibility of customers coming to purchase correct. or taste. For for the sake of the winery. All right. Yeah. Robin, um, we are to uh, change to AG one. Recommended, stated um, recommendation that we all. Of this area that require a separate all of the other I'm sorry from, I missed from, a little bit of that okay right now that was a DRB though I believe that was yes. there is yeah oh right. to rezone yes it would when I mean, that would be the responsibility of each property owner to come in and to do it. He couldn't do that, nor... Right. Yes. Okay, that's yeah. what I thought. That's not his... So, yeah. That was just a consider. recommendation. Right. Okay. That's not staff's recommendation. No, it's no, not. No, no, that's what I said. I just wanted to clarify that, that was DRB there would be a, have to be another meeting. And made a comment about it. Right. Looks like DRB made a comment about that, but that's yeah. not right. staff's recommendation. Okay. Robin, does... does uh, 1B, where it says no more than one dwelling, does that mean that they cannot rent out that apartment anymore? So that dwelling means a primary dwelling. So um, the apartment that's above in the barn, it could be considered a guest house. So no, we don't allow to rent out, but it's intended to be for family use or someone who works on the farm. So it is okay. Correct, yeah. And also, I'm assuming that seeing that we're on 1B, Assuming that would prohibit them from saying we want a winery now and in five years say I want to subdivide this into one acre lots when we turn to AG1. Correct. So that would, that would prohibit that, from that. Yes. That's, that, that's the concern is this is opening up for, is this, is this a backdoor into you know, one acre lots? Right. And um, yes, it, it zones it so you can't subdivide it, but uh, the applicant will probably mention that within their covenants that they can't subdivide additional lots Excellent. in the subdivision so now in terms of the um, current variance for the barn is there any recommendation like can they actually um, ex you know expand that barn or anything like that can they um, so basically um, it would be considered an accessory structure and ac accessory structures should be subordinate to it and so um, I mean, I, if he wanted to make it larger, then I guess he would have to go to the Board of Zoning Appeals and ask for an additional variance uh, to enlarge that structure because, or I'm sorry, he'd have to do a modification. So he'd have to modify the site plan to have a larger structure and modify the AG1 zoning, which sounds really weird because we just don't usually have zoning on AG1. So if you want to uh, amend something then you need to, that's a condition, then you need to go back to city council to ask for that, um, uh, var not a variance, but for that change. So, okay, I mean, again, the, I'm just making sure like, there doesn't need to be anything else added into a potential condition right. that says they Because cannot. it's based upon the site plan, so they'd come in for a zoning modification and then a concurrent variance to enlarge that accessory structure but keep in mind, it can't become a 5,000 square foot structure because then it would no longer be subordinate to the primary house that's around 40 some odd hundred square feet. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I just wanted to make sure, hypothetically, nothing need, would need to be addressed in a condition about that. They would obviously have to go through another process, another to, process to even yes. do that. Okay. I had a question on the standards review because number six it says that 
if they can sell wine per the state of Georgia fine wine regulations, then we come back on the recommended conditions and say that can't sell wine to can't have people coming on the property to purchase wine. So meaning that they could sell it wholesale or they could sell it to other retailers. And just a comment on that is I don't think I think wineries are a great use of our land. I'm assuming the only reason we are not or we're trying to exclude customers and visitors because because what it's, it's in a subdivision. Not, Correct. You know, it's a, and, yeah. You know. And I think the applicant will have some um, comments about our suggested. Uh, I don't think wine tasting bad thing for us in general if, it, if it's in the right place I just would like to know a little more about that and, and then okay and then I know we had kind of discussed this in the pre-read that we had uh, in regards to are there is there any requirement that you know somebody having a winery has to also own that residence on the property I believe Paul was going to it is not a state requirement uh, that you um, actually. So just for the um, information for everybody else, a question had come up about having, you know, would he be required to remain on the property? Um, and I kind of made a parallel with there's many people who own farms who have barns and they don't live on the property, but they operate. A farm or a boarding you know they have horses and they go and they they take care of the horses and may go back to another property to live at so um, we do have use permits that do require I mean it's, this is not a use permit but just for your information some use permits do say you know the owner has to live on the property to property to operate that business ie a bed and breakfast they have to live on within that structure um, that's an example of where we call out for a property owner to live there. So, uh, for the for the record, the state uh, law with respect to farm wineries only requires it to be uh, located on premises that uh, the a substantial portion of the premises are used for agri agricultural purposes. That's it doesn't require uh, anyone to the owner to reside on the premises. Okay. And would this then be a substantial, would this then be the substantial proportion of the property would be for that purpose? I mean, you can ask the applicant. It, I mean, yeah. I will say, actually, in fact, it also, there's the second option is if it's uh, operated by persons engaged in production of a substantial portion of the agricultural produce used in production. So there's a couple of ways that it doesn't need to be either a substantial portion of the produce that's being uh, grown or essential portion of the acreage is being used for it. Okay. But uh, no requirement whatsoever about residing there. Okay. Obviously, we can obviously ask staff any other questions afterwards. Has anybody else got any other questions for staff before we have the applicant come up? Why was this CUP in the first place? You'll have to ask the applicant. It was just developed that way. Many times in Fulton County, um, they would zone to CUP so they could private they could privatize the roads and put a gate up. So if you think about white columns, the portions of white columns, I don't know. Maybe uh, Mr. Rosenberger can answer that question more directly about that. But could he put his winery on the CUP zoning? So that was the purpose of rezoning to AG1. So he, he can't. I mean, I'd have to look it up. Yeah, I mean, of course, and you can ask that question to the applicant because, but um, that was, the, I don't think he would do this if he could have kept it as CUP. So, um, but according to the information that has been given to me, that that was the purpose is to be able to be licensed by the state as a winery. I mean, obviously, he can grow grapes and do what he wants to privately on his land, but to be able to be established as a, a winery, um, there's a requirement uh, to be agriculture. So. Anybody else have any other questions for staff before we have the applicant come up? Okay, yeah. thanks Robin. Mr. Rosenberger, would you like to come up? If you could please state your name and address for the record. 
James Rosenberger, and um, currently it's 13560 Black Merle, which is the lot next door. So 13555, which is the property that we're looking to uh, to do this little project on, is 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 was our old horse barn that we decided to get out of the horse business because I have a bunch of lazy kids that wouldn't take care of them. Um, <laughs> so the horses got out and the grapes moved in. Um, and that's kind of where this whole project uh, started from. I wanted to um, clarify a couple things, um, just, just to, for the record. On the presentation, it said there's 10 lots in Boxwood Estates. There's really only eight. Um, there's a lot outside <coughs> the gate that was, we don't even know who owns it because it was foreclosed on for not paying taxes. And a couple of years ago, the HOA voted to, to move them out of the Boxwood Estates. Um, the other lot that I think I saw up there is, is, is land owned by the HOA, by the community. And it's really just a, a buffer lot that uh, is not buildable. Um, so there's really only eight lots in the subdivision. Uh, my wife and I are lucky enough to own three of them. So I, I really only have five other neighbors with, uh, with homes there. Um, actually, four homes and then a vacant lot. A um, <coughs> couple comments. I just want to, uh, I wrote down some notes as you, you all were talking. And you know, number, number one, uh, we're not renting that apartment. Uh, we, we don't want land. We don't, we, don't, we don't be landlords. It's just not a thing. We've been through enough of that, and that's something we would never consider doing. Um, as Robin mentioned, the uh, covenants for Boxwood Estates strictly prohibit subdividing. So we could not at a later date say, oh, we're going to do one acre tracks and got 10 of them. Great. You know, going to make a bunch of money on land development. Uh, we don't have that option, even if that was a plan. The other part of that is when you saw that um, oddly shaped lot that we have, um, a lot of that's floodplain. Um, so you couldn't build a home there if you wanted to. Uh, we use it as pastures for the horses. We use it as a riding ring. But the, the spot where we've designated for the house to be is really the only spot for a house on that 11 acres because of the floodplain issues that we've, we've run into. Um, as far as expanding the barn, that was another question that was asked. Um, that probably wouldn't be possible either because of the way that lot is shaped and because we're consuming a lot of the buildable area for the house. Um, and then the rest of it, the barn is already there. So you really, it'd be very difficult to expand that barn just based on the topography of it. So I think we're kind of locked into an eight-stall barn. That's, that's all it would ever be. Um, and the idea about, uh, someone brought up the idea of concerts. Um, that sounds great, but um, that sounds like a lot of work. Um, grapes and wine for my wife and I is kind of our, the next chapter in our life. You know, as we own an IT company, that's our main business. We spend a lot of time in that business. And... And going to more of a, an easier life, farming, um, is really kind of what we're planning for ourselves as far as the next chapter uh, in our lives. I'll be 60 next year, so I'm kind of starting to think about when do I get out of this IT, very high-stress environment that we're in that we've been in for about 25 years now. So that's kind of the, some, some background behind that. Um, I did want to bring up the one point, I think it was C, where it says um, the condition that there be no customers to come and taste and, and buy the wine. And... Although we can live with that, we don't want to live with that. Um, we can figure out a way to do it some other way. Um, under a George Farm Winery Act, you're entitled five tasting rooms throughout the state. So I could do the wine there and then go set up a tasting room in downtown Roswell and come taste the wine there. That, that would be a way around it. Uh, we could certainly do some mail order stuff that would allow us to, 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 to sell wine via that route. Um, one of the things that I've committed to my neighbors on, and one of the things that wanted to point out is our covenants for the neighborhood strictly enforce what types of business you can run out of your home. And there's a passage in there that says, residential use, all lots shall be used for those activities that are consistent with the current zoning attached to each individual lot. However, the board may, but shall not be obligated to, permit a lot to be used for business purposes other than those permitted by the current zoning as long as such business in the sole discretion of the board does not otherwise violate the provisions of the Declaration of Bylaws, does not create a disturbance, and does not create parking congestion. So if, if I had a winery that brought in 10 extra cars, the neighborhood could say, we don't want that, and they would have the ability to shut that down. One of the things that was suggested 
at the last meeting was to get letters from my neighbors. And remember, I only have five of them. <laughs> um, I have letters from three. The other two have committed to getting me letters, but without me being a hound saying, where's my letter, where's my letter? Um, they'll be forthcoming. I'll be happy to present those. But here's um, a letter, an email from my next door neighbor, Kip and Cindy Coombs, who ironically are already AG1. So why they're AG1 and why we're a cup, they're on three acres, we're on 11. I, I don't understand how that happened other than I think the former owner maybe for some reason saw a benefit in being AG1 and he actually got switched from cup to AG1 I think seven, eight years ago. Um, dear, dear, dear Jim and Darren, that's exciting to hear about your plans next door. We are very supportive of your request of a zoning change from cup to AG1 to accommodate a small family farm and winery. I was surprised you didn't have that in the first place. I appreciate you stating that your plans do not, you're not gonna commercialize the property and that you won't do anything to just, uh, cause a disturbance to the quality of life as neighbors. We're very grateful for that. So one of the things that I had offered to Robin was, rather than saying there's absolutely no tastings, what we're very agreeable to is no business hours. We've never envisioned this to be a retail location where people can show up Monday you know, through Saturday from 10 to five for, this would be a small by appointment only. Another thing to consider, this is a gated community. How would people come in to taste it unless it wasn't there? Would my phone be ringing all day? Buzz me in, buzz me in, buzz me in. That wouldn't even be practical on, on a business case. So what we see is no commercial hours, no retail store, just a, a by appointment, come by and have a taste of wine and, and leave. And it'd be really small sets of people, five, 10 at the most. Because once again, IT is our main business. We're not looking to start a winery. Um, just too much work involved in that whole process. So that was some of my comments. Like I said, I can you know, give to Robin the covenants that were recorded and that clearly show that the neighborhood decides what type of business can be there. Um, along with three emails that all support what we're doing, um, you know, at, at, at a high level basis. And, and as I mentioned, you know, being agreeable to saying you can't have regular business hours there, you can't have a commercial winery. Absolutely, we don't want that anyway. So that's kind of a summary of, of what I've uh, prepared. Um, if, if Robin didn't mention, the home we're looking to build is about a 5,000 square foot home. Uh, we worked on with an architect uh, for about a year on plans uh, and we're hopefully if lumber prices go down uh, hopefully gonna break ground within a month here so we're excited about that thank you so much uh, anybody got any questions for mr. Rosenberger I have uh, a couple um, lot six have a house on it the lot six is 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 where the barn is. If you want me to step over there, I can point it out. Or yeah, so lot six is the first thing you're talking about. Lot, lot six is talking. Yeah, lot six is the lot that's in question. Here. So yeah, yeah, that's the subject site. It right. just kind of. My wife and I own, own six, seven, and eight. Those are the ones okay. that we currently have. Seven. Uh, no, seven no, is no. my current residence. It is. Yeah, that's already seven there. Seven is, is. Correct. Right. Whatever. It's, 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 seven. It, it, it's, it's, list, it's, it's, well, it, it was listed for sale, then the contract didn't go through, so we're not sure if we're going to uh, uh, put go it back to the, the market. Mic. Oh, sorry. <laughs> We're not sure what we're doing yet. It just was supposed to close uh, uh, a couple weeks ago, and it didn't go through. The gentleman couldn't get his financing, so we're not sure what we're doing at this point. Um, and then lot eight is, is a lot that we own, but that's just vacant land. There, um, are there um, fire hydrants available Absolutely. at the uh, cul de sac there's, there's a fire hydrant directly in front of lot six. The proposed thing, there's right a lot, lot six. right there. Okay, so there's room for a fire truck to come down and turn around. Correct, and we, 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 we designed the barn that way because when we had, we had up to eight horses at one point and we had you know, feed trucks and some big commercial trucks coming all, right. all the time. 
uh, delivering things. Uh, the, the driveway's a, a kind of a crush and run gravel driveway. And so they'd come once a year in the big dump trucks and they'd go in there and they'd turn around and they'd dump all the gravel and then they'd smooth it out. So yes, it's, it's, it's had uh, good access for, for many years. Um, septic system. It's on septic, correct. Proposed septic, we had that already approved by Fulton County Environmental. Apartment. That was an initial smaller septic system, and then to build a house, they'll be putting in a second system. You're going to plant vineyard, a vineyard, raise grapes, make wine out of it. You're going to bring grapes in from other producers or juice or something? We are. So part of the, the story is um, my wife and I like wine, and we like good wine, and we're not sure how good the wine that we're growing in Georgia is going to be. So our plan is, under the Georgia Farm Winery Act, 40% of our production has to come from Georgia grapes. So we have some relationships with some really uh, high-end California Napa-based wineries as well as some uh, Washington wineries as well. And our plan is to kind of blend them together um, so that we have maybe a higher quality wine than Georgia is potentially known for uh, by taking some of the the, the local uh, wines like Muscadine and Blanc de Bois and Lenore, which is a Spanish bunch grape, and then blending them with some of the more traditional Cabernet Sauvignons and Pinot Noirs that we're getting out of the West Coast. That's the plan is to create uh, our own brand through blending, um, blending of the grapes. So, how how much how many acres of vineyards do you plan on your property? So right now we have sixty vines in the ground. Um, at this point, I don't have any plans to plant more. Um, I'm not sure I can farm. Uh, I planted them last year. I lost about a third. Uh, I replanted the ones that I lost, and I'm you know, trying to do as much uh, online uh, learning and <laughs> reading as many books. Um, so at this point, we're, we're sticking with the 60. Um, if, if, if it went well, we would maybe double that. But like I said, this will never be a commercial operation. My wife and I want to do this ourselves. And at some point, it becomes so uh, uh, consuming that we'd have to hire staff and bring people in, and that's not what we're looking to do uh, with this kind of like hobby. It's kind of like a hobby winery, you know, for my wife and I. That uh, location that you planted those? Uh, oh, um, um, the, the one of Right there. Oh, okay. Yeah, there's Front a picture part. in the staff report that shows some vines. So, so visibly oh, okay. from the street, it's, you've got this beautiful you know, vineyard right there. So it's very appealing for the neighborhood. All the neighbors, it's really cool. It has blue tubes on it right now because they're grow tubes that they don't look great. But they're all really excited about having a, uh, they used to have horses in the front. Um, and they dug up the grass, which was, was uh, but now they're going to have beautiful uh, uh, vines growing right there. Going back to what Marty was saying, if you look at 60 vines you have, yep, and let's assume the most wine you could make, that'd be 40% of your supply, 40% of the gross goes into How many bottles are we talking about? 500, 600. So this is not like, this is, this is not, we're not going to be in Kroger. I mean, yeah, okay. um, just a boutique winery. Yeah, yeah, boutique winery. You mentioned that you'll be doing some blending. Yes. Would the equipment for that blending be on your? Yeah, all off site. Because we even, once again, we can pay someone to do that. Um, and they'll probably do it better because we don't know what we're doing. And I don't know if at this point, you know, we don't want to invest in all that technology and the equipment. You know, there's, that takes a big operation. And for us, it's, you know, we want to, um, so we actually, we, we sent out our first wine um, at Christmas, uh, we did our first blend and really our grapes aren't ready. Our grapes are still a couple years away, but what we did is I connected with a, uh, a really nice, uh, uh, California winery, Canard Vineyards, and I created our own label and then we sent it out, we sent out two bottles to all of our IT customers and they loved it. You know, it had our label on there, our name on the back. It said produced by Canard Vineyards because under federal law, we can't claim production. They're the ones that made the wine. We just simply put our label on it. 
And we're not allowed to sell it because we don't have a liquor license yet, but we were able to give it out. So we gave it out to all of our customers and the response was, was phenomenal. They're like, whoa, this is great, Jim. I can't believe what you and Darren are doing. My wife's name is Darren. Um, and so that's kind of the model we want to replicate. It's more or less private labeling than it is having a big commercial winery. So, and my wife's some, kind of a marketing whiz. So, you know, the idea of getting like an online wine club and doing some of those types of uh, uh, sales and marketing events is really um, what the long-term vision would be. Now, is the Co I know you had mentioned about the Coombs property. So is the Coombs property actually in your subdivision? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, directly next door. There would be... Yeah, no, no, I see them on this plan because on the plan it says that they're zone CUP. And, and our zoning map, it doesn't say AG1, and I've been here the whole 14 years. If you, so. go, if you, go, if you go online to the uh, Fulton County Tax Assessor's Office, it says AG1. And that, it does, that's incorrect. <laughs> Can't go by that. Okay. It, it, I mean, it's CUP. I mean, it's okay, all well, CUP. Okay, well, I mean, that's, that's where I got my information was okay. from, from the Fulton County Assessor's site. Yep. Okay. And it's funny because Kip thinks he's AG1. So he's like, I'm AG1. I'm like, you are? He's like, yeah. I'm like, and I double checked. I'm like, gosh, you are. So I have, to, I have to let Kip know that. No, you um, could make your case much more compelling if you brought some of that wine in. <laughs> How long are you going to be here? <laughs> we need to be here. <laughs> Give me 10 minutes. <laughs> now, um, in regards to, you know, your comment about the Georgia Farm Winery Act and yes. that it allows five tasting rooms can you elaborate more on, like, how would tasting rooms work? Would there be something that you'd have people would normally pay to come into the tasting room? Well, the, if we're allowed to have some type of tasting room on this property, it would be, hey, Jerry, we got a tasting room. Come on over, you know? It wouldn't, we wouldn't be doing advertising. We wouldn't be doing, you know, it's more or less by invitation only to come taste the wine. Um, when I mentioned the five tasting rooms, there's another winery, uh, 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 the Painted Horse, here in town. And they, under the Georgia Farm Winery law, they could, in theory, go up to Roswell or Johns Creek or downtown Atlanta and get a little, you know, 400 square foot space. And actually, under the liquor license that the George Farm Winery Act provides, they could have then a retail operation where people came in and they said, you know, here's twenty dollars. I want the white flight, or here's thirty dollars. I want the red flight, and they could operate up to five under that act. So my my point for bringing that up was simply, if if you guys restrict our ability to have tastings, I may have to go off and seek another way to do that. You know, and that's not what we want to do because it's more work, more overhead, uh, more investment. Um, but that would kind of be our only way to allow people to taste the wine to be compliant with what we're, you know, what would you guys decide here? So that would be the only way around us having people test, taste wine is just take advantage of what the Farm Winery Act states. Now, do you, does that act or anything require you to have any other si types of licenses to be able to have a tasting room? Well, it's my understanding um, is that, you know, today um, is really step one. You know, if we get the, the zoning, the proper AG zoning, you know, we can then go to the federal level, then the state level, and then the city level to apply for the proper licenses to, to have wine. Um, and it's my understanding that could take up to a year. So, you know, we're still pretty early in this whole process of actually having people come taste wine. Um, but it's, it's our understanding that we would need to get, you know, th those three, that we need to get a federal, state, and, and local license. Then we'd have to get a business license, which the city of Milton would have to approve. So there's lots of other steps involved before we can actually start doing what we're, we're trying to do here. Hey, Robin. The staff knew about the fact that the HOA would limit the number of people coming before they made the recommendation that said not to allow that. So what is, why is staff not willing to say, let the HOA control that and not do it by a conditional, a conditional variance? Well, we were just trying to be as, um, have, you know, your belt and suspenders. And, you know, obviously it's our staff recommendation. So if you all feel that you have another recommendation based upon the information that you've been given, then you have that ability to make other recommended conditions. So this document was, was not in their hands at the last meeting. <laughs> They, they were not aware of the fact that okay. the neighborhood... That, that was my question. Yeah, the neighborhood, they, they didn't have this at the time. 
And I, that, I brought it up and I said, there's, there's a declaration that says this. But it, I, I didn't know I would need that, so I didn't think to bring it. So that's why I've submitted it to Robin um, after and brought it here tonight is because I wanted to say, you know, listen, um, the neighbors, the, my five neighbors really decide what we do with this thing. You know, they could shut this thing down like that if there's too many cars coming through the gate. Are all five on the board? Who's on your HOA board? Um, McCorby's, Coombs, and my wife. I want to be sure it was you and your wife. <laughs> so is that, is, are those covenants actually recorded? Absolutely. Against the title, there, basically? Yeah, there's a deed book and page number that's recorded at the Don at Fulton County, correct. Gotcha. And then here's, here's the document, because we amended them about a year or so. And, you know, here's the, the, uh, the documents. And then every homeowner has signed and notarized these changes. So all, all eight lot owners have signed and notarized. I've did it three times, obviously, but um, it's, it's all been recorded down. So is there a, a sun, sunset date on it, or how long is those are the covenants? Perpetuity. Huh? Perpetuity. There's no, there's no okay. sunset date on there. Some covenants expire. Yeah, so. sure. Do you mind passing that on so we could take a look at that? Yeah, you okay. can just give it. So are you actually going to make and bottle the wine on your property? Um, no. We're going to have that done elsewhere. So you're not going to need vats and destemmers and crushers and I might do you know a little side product to see if I can pull it off but the stuff we want to distribute absolutely not you know when as I mentioned the stuff we sent out around Christmas time our, our clients were like oh that was amazing Jim it was like a really we got really lucky we found um Canard Vineyards they had about uh, 200 cases of a wine they produced for a a, a, a a Florida restaurant chain that went out of business because of COVID and so he had uh, it was a 2014 red blend um, that was sitting on the shelf, unlabeled. And Adam Fox, the owner of Kennard, I called him up and he's like, I can, I'll sell you this stuff at a great price. He told me 20 bucks a bottle. I'm like, can I do any cheaper? He's like, it cost me more to make it. He's like, no, I can't. He's like, I'm doing you a favor. So we did. We stuck our label on it. As I mentioned, our clients were just ecstatic. They were just like, oh, this is one of the best wine I've ever tasted. So it was a... Uh, it's about a seventy-five dollar bottle if you were to buy it from the vineyard. Probably about a hundred dollar bottle in, uh, in in a in a restaurant. And like I said, we, we got it for twenty dollars a bottle. So it was a really it was a good thing that we could do for our first release. Our clients were super happy, and uh, that's something we want to try to replicate. You know, just to have really high quality, very tasty wine that is priced super affordable uh, that people can enjoy. I know there was a previous question about, are you aware if you can actually do this under CUP, or do you have to change it to AZ-1? I, so, I can actually answer that. Okay. The, the, the uh, section 64895-1 says the only allowed uses on a uh, cup property is single-family dwelling, golf course, country club, pool, and recreation. Oh. Actually, correct. And what the interesting thing about that is, well... Because when we thought about coming before the board and asking for rezoning, we actually played idea played around with the idea of what if we put in a frisbee golf course and then make the bar in a country club because Cup allows that, and then we could get a liquor license in a country club. So, but I realized that that was like the back door into this thing, and I'm a very transparent guy who doesn't play games. I mean, this is what we're trying to do. We got a small family hobby winery, and we're trying to get the zoning so we can do it the right way and not go in through a frisbee golf you know, backdoor method, which according to that, you could, but like I said, we're not, that's not who we are. <laughs> yes, I understand staff's hesitancy and, and we put in there about, you know, customers and visitors coming in. You also mentioned that you might be open to something of, you know, by appointment, you know, one. It would only be by appointment. Yeah, one, you know, one party at a time or something like that. I don't know. I, I would be interested in, in looking at, Doing something like that, adding something like this to this again to help the—I I, don't—I don't see much downside. I get you don't want traffic, you don't want guys that have been spent all afternoon in the tasting bars, driving in the subdivisions. I get all that, but I don't know what you, what do you guys think? I'd be interested in looking in some way to limit that to one party, a part, you know, appointment only type of taste. Uh, let's hold that discussion okay. for discussion, okay? And that way we can just try to make sure we go ahead and ask the applicant anything else that we want to ask him. We'll bring that up on discussion. Anybody else got any other questions for the yeah, applicant? It's, it's not uncommon for wineries to have by appointment only, and it's it's 
very rare that you get a free tasting anymore. So people pay for tastings and um, they're, they're not averse to making an appointment so the winery can regulate who comes, when they come, how many come. You've got a lot of flexibility that way. And Robin, maybe you can help me out. Isn't, I think there's a couple wineries in Milton. Isn't there one in a subdivision who does it by appointment only? The one in Sunnybrook Farms or something? I don't know. I just know he grows it. I have no idea. Yeah, but there, whether I, I found he... another one that was, it's, when you go to their website, and I, I should have brought it. I apologize for that. But it says clearly by appointment only. You, know, you just can't go there on a, on a Thursday at, at 4 o'clock and expect to get wine. It's like, you know, there's gates, and that's what we have as well. So, yeah, that's, that's always been our plan. So there is another winery in Sunnybrook Farms, which is a, subdiv a large lot subdivision that's off of Hopewell. So um, there is a, a winery that operates. But again, it's nothing like Painted Horse in the sense of it's very low-key, and they just produce grapes, and I guess from what you say, yeah, by appointment that. only. No, I, I, I know Pam fairly well, oh, Pam Jackson over at Painted Horse, because um, I have a 21-year-old a, a uh, fireman up in Hall County and an 18-year-old first-year college student at Georgia State, and they both went to horseback riding camp since they were that big at the Painted Horse called Pamelot, the farm at Pamelot, and they actually spent so many years there that then we turned, you know, 13 and 14, they became camp counselors, and they spent a lot of years as camp counselors at, 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 at Pamela, at, at the Painted Horse. So we know Pam fairly well. My kids know their family very well. In fact, my son Vincent, the fireman, he actually planted all her grapes. He was actually in between jobs, and she called him up, and she said, I got a job for you. And he came home like 10 hours later with like blisters on all his hands. He's like, I'm never doing that again. You know? but, so we know their operation very well. I've been there, I think, twice. And you know, that's, that's their business. That's what they're doing to make money. And, and it's, we're very, very different in our mission statement and what our plans are. Um, they're on Bethany Bend, you know, with a lot more accessibility. We're in a subdivision. So, you know, we, we certainly uh, wouldn't do anything to upset our neighbors. We, we love our neighbors. In fact, they're some of our best friends. So it's, uh, I think, very cooperative in, in, in nature. Anybody else got any other questions for the applicant? You said, a oh, man. Yes, I missed it. Um, the apartment in uh, with the barn. You can you that apartment? Best house for family. People okay. Can stay. Yeah. In fact, in fact, if we were to sell the big house that we're trying to you know sell, and if our new house isn't completed, my wife and I, and, you know, we'll move in the barn. You know, right. for some period of time. So. So no, it, it would not be everything, anything other than just, you know, a guest room, a guest house, whatever you would call it. Anybody else got anybody? Any other questions for the applicant? Okay. Thanks, Mr. Rosenberger. Thank you very much. Appreciate your time. Thank you. The covenants there, Marty's got those. Okay. All right, does uh, anybody have any other questions for uh, staff? You want to check for any public comment on yeah. online? We have no public comment. No yeah, public online. comment online? No. Okay, yeah, thanks. Um, anybody, okay. No other questions for staff. Was there something, was there, were you researching anything else for us, Paul? I forgot. Was that, that was the only question? Uh, I, the last I was looking up was the cup approval. The cup approval, okay. Okay. All right, then I'll open the floor up for discussion or motion. Uh, I, city to have appointment tasting. I could envision things like wine tasting, dinner at a restaurant and milk. I think I would like to explore a way to buy appointment one party mission rather than that encompass actually being able to 
not on not on Saturday. For, from their side, no, it would just be you know come to the wine tasting and maybe go to a restaurant. Again, this is just thinking, you know, trying to think out of the box. How do we uh, bring additional people up to, to, to and and lengthen their stay and have them contribute to other other local businesses? You know, I'm I'm just saying no right now. I just think you know. By appointment only, one visitor at a time, just to come in and taste the wine. And so then, that require then. I mean, I think they're going to have to have a business license regardless, but... Regardless? Right. Right? They'll have to, if, if they're a winery and they sell, they'll have to have a business license and then apply for all their... They, I mean, there's lots of paperwork. They have to have a business license regardless. Right. Yeah. But there would be no other... Would they have to have any other licenses if they were actually going to be able to sell on-site? That's That's part of the allowance of being a winery but as far as i know there's a lot of other i don't know specifically but they'll have to get the alcohol license from us to operate a winery because we have different regulations than the state does um, and then there may be other uh, requirements um, you want to ask the applicant or city attorney but um, yes definitely um, business license and then um, whatever other licenses the alcohol license for the winery now, let me ask you this, Robin, knowing that potentially they have these covenants now, would that change staff's opinion any on the recommendation that they made for that condition? I mean, I think it does um, change it a bit. I mean, maybe if, you know, it, it's up to you all. But, yes, I think that that um, influences, you know, how to go about the conditions, so. I think when you take a look at the recommended conditions, I, I personally think we should remove C, which says a winery, but excluding customers, visitors coming onto the property to take purchase of the wine. I think you, you allow that to be governed by the HOA, instead of getting more regulations and everything involved. I think my concern with that is, you know, that that's very temporary right now. I mean, the HOA can change, whereas if we said you, know, you could have one visitor at a time, or some limited that way to appointment only. I think that would ha that would go with the property versus the, the HOA might HOA might be more temporary. I I, I agree with you, Kurt. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm uncomfortable relying on the HOA um, for our enforcement mechanism here. I, I think tasting well, rooms sell, right? Well, I think that's, that, sell, that's right? innate in the winery. That's part of, um, uh, within AG1, a winery is, you know, a use that is permitted by rights, so. With permit, so. Right, they would still have to get the alcohol permit through the city and the, the state winery, and I think there's even a federal um, license they have to get. But your condition in terms of the recommended commission is saying no, they're not allowed to purchase. And so even if but they on have... On the site, I mean, it's On not, site. Yeah. Um, or maybe if you said, you know, uh, customers by appointment only or, you know, I don't know. It's something in between, you know, <laughs> between, the, um, between the covenants and what this current recommendation is, so... But again, if you, 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 if we were to not have anything in there in regards to the purchasing part, again, there's kind of two things, I guess. Then, if they have their licenses in place, and hypothetically, if they were to be allowed to have customers come, whether it's by appointment or however, the customers could actually come, and then they could actually purchase the wine from them there. With the licenses, if we um, eliminated that. But if we restricted that, we could restrict that in the conditions. And so even though they may have licenses in place, they still cannot actually sell on site. Oh, correct. Correct? Right. Okay. Is there a problem with them selling the wine? 
on site? Yeah. Well, other than I, I guess traffic, traffic. <laughs> yeah, flow you, you through, know, I mean, potentially getting into do. more of a business being there, basically, and people coming in and out, and you know, it may not even be, you know, again, then you're talking about restricting. You, yes, one is one restriction potentially is about coming in and tasting. Now, all of a sudden, if you don't have any restrictions and you're allowing them to sell, then every day people could come, and as long as they're okay with that, people are coming on site and just coming in and saying, hey, I'm not tasting, I'm just coming to buy, and next thing you know, you've got a lot of people coming through who are just buying. They're not actually there for a tasting by an appointment. Or, you know, I mean, there's something else that you've got to look into about that as well. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think if we limit it to by appointment only, I think they should have the ability to buy if they're there. That would be my, th my thought. Again, you're not opening a, a wine store up there. You know, but again, if you're bringing people into taste it, the next thing is, hey, and I think it's good for well, business, too. It. I think it, you yeah, know, it helps you're going to want to buy it, right? Yeah, you're going to want to buy a bottle or two or three. You're not, you're not talking you about control that. Yeah, by appointment. Yeah, by appointment only, not to exceed five a day or so. I mean, we can, uh, yeah. Uh, I know Mr. Rosenberg has got his hand up. If you guys are okay, well, I'm going to allow him to come back up. You want to say something else? <clears throat> Can you just, excuse me, one second, just for, for formality's sake, could you make a motion to reopen the public? Yeah, okay. Uh, I'll make the motion to, to motion to reopen the public comment and allow for the applicant to speak again. Second. Second. Uh, we'll just go with Mr. Gilbert on the second. <laughs> okay, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Anybody opposed? Okay. Sorry. My only comment was, you know, I think you'd be doing me, a, doing me a favor if you said to buy wine, you have to do a tasting because we don't want to be a wine store liquor. You know, I don't want to have to think I'm coming by to get two bottles. That's we've never envisioned that. And I think it's almost like if you had it, if you're there for a tasting, you can buy some wine, but you can't go buy wine. You know, that's that would actually help us a lot because we wouldn't want the burden and responsibility of having to have a, a, a liquor store type of operation. You know, it's like if you're there and you taste the wine and you like it, you can buy a bottle. But you can't just show up to buy a bottle of wine. So that was my only comment because I heard you guys talking. I'm like, yeah, that's, that's, I don't want to do that. So thank you. That's, Appreciate that. Well, God, thank you. Thank you. Okay. We'll close the public comment and the applicants and we'll open it back up to discussion for the commission. I think it's a great idea. I, I think uh, it would be a nice uh, uh, addition to the community. I, I think it sounds like it's uh, the right kind of environment and uh, set up a, a tastings by appointment. Small groups come in, taste some wine. If they like it, they buy it, and thank you very much and leave. Um, you could set your hours when you wanted. We, we could put in some, some restrictions as to how many, how often, hours, whatever else, but, but I think it's a great idea. Around the room, Jan, you have any other? No, I just I, I think the the more we help him by not putting too many burdens on him, I think is the best way to go here. I, I agree. I think it's a, a great asset. Ron, uh, yeah, generally, generally I would be supportive of this. Um, I uh, would like to see don't want to turn it into, and I don't think the applicant wants it to turn into um, uh, a place where there's a lot of traffic. And so I think it uh, uh, would be appropriate to, to specify numbers of people um, on, a, on an appointment. Bert, do you have anything else? No, I just, you know, I think we need some help writing that, that new condition. We're, we're sure we got it, but I agree. I agree with everybody. I think it's a great I think it's Milton needs more of this. I think this is a great way to, you know, we, we talk all the time about large lots, large lots, large lots. There's a great way to take, you know, 10 acres and kind of, you know, keep it, mm -hmm. keep it that way, no matter, no matter what happens. And, and again, you know, we have to look too long term. You know, if you were to sell this, whatever we do goes with that. And I know your intentions sound great, but we got to protect against, you know, 10 years from now or 20 years from now. And so that's some of the things we're doing. But um, yeah, but I think we need to, to rework C uh, under the one C on the conditions to you know, by appointment only a, a number of you know, five a day max probably going to be plenty and um, so yeah I think I, I'm up for it. You got anything else, Fred? Okay. 
Seems like we've all discussed. Anybody else? Anybody want to go ahead and make a motion? I'll give it a try. Um, I move that we approve RZ21-04 with the variance VC21-02 with the recommended conditions except for number 1C and that to be reworded to include customer visits and purchase of wine by appointment only and up to five max of five visitors a day five what five visitors a day five five customers a day you know so but it's not a and that's just a number of are you, are you saying five appointments or five, yeah, five, five individuals five appointments good point good thank you Jim. five appointments a day uh, would you, would you want to put a capacity on it so no more than 10 people at one time, or that was the number that I believe the gentleman uh, threw out during sure. the presentation. Not, good idea. Not, not to, not to not, exceed 10 at any one time. Right, right. Yeah. 10 people per visit? Per appointment, yeah. So, okay. So I, have a, I would a, second that. Okay, before, I just want to make sure that do we still need D and E now that we're not excluding the winery? It would just be. Well, it wasn't. Uh, the winery was included as written before. So I think it would still include. This is the uses are restricted to the following uses, which wine makes this makes a winery one of those uses. So okay. it still would say a winery subject to the restrictions that Mr. Nolte okay. just dictated. Okay. Oh, so we're, we're changing, we're getting rid of the but excluding, and he's... Winery. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, so you're okay with still keeping everything else in your motion? Yeah. Or, okay. And so let, I mean, I tried to take notes down here um, to just make sure I clearly understand what you want to change the recommended conditions for 1C. So I've got a winery, uh, a winery with customer visits and purchase of wine by appointment only with a minimum of five appointments. Maximum. 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 Sorry, sorry, with a maximum of five appointments per day, not to exceed 10 persons per appointment. Is that right? A winery? Go ahead. Uh, Ten at any one. Party of four. Party of six. Got it. Okay. Not to exceed ten persons. You okay with that amendment? Yeah. yeah. Or friendly amendment. Okay, so let's say here. A winery with customer visits and purchase of wine by appointment only with a maximum of five appointments per day with a maximum capacity of 10 persons. Tell you what, let's, when you talking capacity, I think with just, I think maximum number of customers okay. of 10 at any one time. Just because it might be staff or workers or something. Okay. <laughs> Maximum number of customers of 10 persons. Okay. All right, so let me reread this again. A winery with customer visits and purchase of wine by appointment only with a maximum of five appointments per day with a maximum of with a maximum number of customer of customers of ten persons at any one time. At any Say per appointment. Well, I think they were trying to get away from per appointment. Per appointment I think they were trying trying sort to get. If they have three appointments at the same time, oh, each I with ten, it. they didn't want to do that. Do, do we need to think about hours? You know, do we need to do this during business hours? Do we need to limit it so it's not a 
midnight or yeah, I think, especially include something like that? Actually, I think that's a good point because it is a residential area. I'd propose maybe nine to six. There's a hand in the back. <laughs> uh, all right. Good with Mr. Rosenberg coming back up. Okay. We'll uh, make a motion. I'll make the motion again to allow public comment and Mr. Rosenberg to come back up as the applicant. Any second. second that? Mr. Gilbert. All those in favor say aye. 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 Anybody opposed? Okay. Come back up again, Mr. Rosenberg. Um, and, and just one final point. One thing I forgot to mention is part of this plan is my wife and I, um, through some of her old friends and network, are she's friends with a lot of the best chefs in Atlanta. And we're planning on doing some, like, wine pairing dinners um, that you might bring 10 people in. You know, it might be one of the appointments, but potentially, you, you know, dinner... Um, could last till 10 maybe you know just i don't know what they thinking it through so certainly maybe some language that says no uh, uh tastings to, to to begin or to, to start no later than seven o'clock you know so that if it's a dinner you can have dinner get out of there by 10 yeah. um but then when you talk about nice things for the city of milton you know we believe we're going to have some really nice executive chef pair dinners at some point we'll have to go through all the licensing uh, to do that once we go through our liquor thing. So that's down the road. But as we're setting some of these ground rules, I just wanted to throw out the idea there may be some, some type of dinner events, like small okay. groups of 10 or less, um, that could maybe run 9, 30, 10 o'clock at the latest. Okay. So, just so, so what you're saying is that this is becoming an event space? No, 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 no. no that's no, what no. it sounds like. A dinner for 10 people, I, I wouldn't call it an event space. No, no. I mean, we're the, the 10 people is something that, um, yeah. We just thought it'd be a fun idea no. to have an executive chef come cook, cook dinner for everyone. So this re this request is just morphing during the during the course of this presentation. Um, I'm not sure exactly. Um, uh, it, well, what you're what you're suggesting now is not in conformance with what we received. Okay. This this was just an idea. There's no no business plan behind it. It was just when you were setting the times, I'm like, well, what if we had a dinner there? So no, if you want to strike that and say no dinners, that's fine. You know, like I said, it was more, more or less just, I wanted to bring it up in case we had a dinner event that lasted until 930. So if you want to put in the conditions, no, no dinner events, that's not part of what we're trying to do here. I just wanted to be, as I mentioned, I'm very transparent and I wanted to be as open and honest as possible. And that's the only reason I brought it up, not to do anything other than just make you fully aware of all of our intentions. So. Anybody else got any questions for Mr. Rosenberg? Oh, I'm, I'm puzzled that uh, having dinner, serving these wine, don't control that. It would prevent them from saying, hey, we're having friends over to my house right. for one. Yeah, yeah exactly. And dinner. <laughs> right. and, and dinner. So I, I don't know how we would control that. I don't know oh, what Ron, I know yeah. where Ron's going with it. I agree. Uh, yeah. But I, I, well, let's, do you have any other questions for no. restricting it? Yeah. And, no and, and the only reason that we even thought about that where it came up was that when we were going through some of the licensing for the, for the, for the uh, liquor license, they want you to serve food because they don't want you serving a bunch of alcohol without having some type of food choice. So that was the, the only reason we got off on this tangent, my wife and I, was because, hey, she knows some chefs. Hey, we can satisfy the need to have a little bit of a, a charcuterie board or something so that people aren't drinking wine and driving in their cars. So that was the only reason we even put it on the, uh, uh, on the docket. Well, so. this was discussed when we did the, the farm winery discussion before of having some type of snacks or food or something. Would the, would the dinner be served in your house or in the winery? It would be in, in, in the tasting room. In the, in the, no, not in the house. In, in that tasting like room right there. like personal guests coming over for dinner and you're serving some of your wine. Yeah, right. Same thing. I apologize if I confuse everyone, but I just wanted to, when I heard you talk about the timing, I was just, you know, we have no problem with the hours you suggested. I think they're great. You know, the, 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 the five appointments, the ten people, wonderful. It's it's perfect. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Rosenberger, as you're going, could you make sure that with Robin or someone with staff that they get a copy of the um, actual uh, covenant so that they can go into the, in the record? I just want to make sure they go into the record. 
I, I mean, again, <laughs> I think we go back to what you had, Samit, and we add maybe the hours. We stop it at six, like something like that, and, and that's where we cut it off. The dinner part, I would just, I, I don't think we go there. Whole food things are a little different. Oh, um, also, just if I can interject, um, it, prepare food, you know, in a more organized way like that. It would require, you know, additional uh, licensing, commercial kitchen, et cetera. So, um, mm -hmm. okay. So, you, what do you guys say? What else do you want to talk about with this? <laughs> so do we agree on the hours? No, yeah. Nine to six or? Nine to six. Wine only, with the exception of cheese or whatever. I think that's required, right? Some, some food being available, some charcuterie or whatever. I mean, I think there were some discussions about food when we were looking at the beer and liquor last summer, but um, I think most of the wineries, from what I understand, they do offer some, you know, cheese and crackers and, you know, some light snacks okay. type of thing that are already prepared that you can pur purchase type of thing. So we're, 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 I, 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 I think we got, we're all in agreement. We don't want to turn this into a restaurant. Right. Yeah. So, um, so I, I, But there's nothing else required for that. I mean, they are allowed to, I mean, if they have to, if they're going to sell even anything like that, crackers and cheese or whatever, I mean. I know the other wineries do. When they serve wine, they have available, you know, already prepared food that, that they sell. It's, you know, just like going to a vending machine and getting a candy bar out um, in the sense that, I'm not saying that's literally what's happening, but from what I understand how other um, wineries operate. Artie, you've been... <laughs> <laughs> I didn't mean that to sound negative. Well, the, the serious wineries have uh, like a deli attached to them, and you can get a loaf of bread and some cheese and go out on the benches and have lunch with your bottle of wine. I don't think he has uh, anything like that planned here. Um, and I've been to a lot of wine tastings where there was nothing. You, you just went in and, and tasted your wine and thank you very much and, and left. Went to, the, went to the next one as quickly as you could. <laughs> so. Okay. Yes. Um, so we just need to add in, uh, yeah. Okay, so I'm going to reread what we have so far. Uh, a winery with customer visits and purchase of wine by appointment only with a maximum of five appointments per day with a maximum of 10 customers with hours of operation from 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. at any time. Okay, with a maximum of 10 the maximum number of customers of 10 persons at any time. All right, let me reread this one more time. Well, just for my <laughs> clarification, the, um, the appointments, five, five appointments in a day, up to 10 people at an appointment. Up to 10 people at a, at a time there. At so it, time. Could be, so it could be 10 appointments and 10 individual people who are, are so potentially sorry. 50 people in a day uh, on a good yeah, day. Yeah, the maximum would time. be. Otherwise, by right. appointments, you can make ten, five appointments for 10, 10 a.m. and have five people each. And so you, so could, you, you could just, have. You could yeah, have, you could have fifty people. Yeah, you could each have appointment. 50 people. Each appointment could have ten people. Gotcha. Or you so could have ten two people for the whole day total. It's ten people per appointment. Basically, ten people at one time together. One time. Yeah. So okay. if that is hypothetically one appointment that's ten people, and he does that five times that day, then yeah, there's five, fifty different people that are there. Or you could have five appointments at the same time and only two people per appointment. Yep, Correct. Exactly. With a maximum of 10. <clears throat> right. 
Yep. Okay. Get that operation, hours of operation. It was hard for me to hear. Sorry. Yeah. Let me read it again one more time. Got so many scratch up. A winery with customer visits and purchase of wine by appointment only with a maximum of five appointments per day with a maximum number of customers of 10 persons at any time with hours of operation from 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. 9 a.m. to 5 p.m.? 6. 6, 6 p.m. Yes. Does that capture everything? Yes, that captured everything. Okay. Second that motion. Okay. So we got the motion on the floor from Mr. Nolte is to uh, approve this with the recommended conditions from staff, changing Section 1C to be a winery with customer visits and purchase of wine by appointment only with a maximum of five appointments per day with a maximum number of customers of 10 persons at any time with hours of operation from 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. Seconded by Mr. Edwards. Everybody good? All those in favor, say aye. 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 Anybody opposed? Okay, that motion is passed. Good luck, Mr. Rosenberger. <laughs> Mr. Gilbert, definitely we'd like to make that appointment right now for the planning commission. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. We will move on to the next agenda item, which is the discussion of flag lots. Um, so this is part two of um, the flag lot of the flag lot uh, discussion. Um, so uh, Commissioner Gilbert gave me a, a nice outline. He called it the flag lot primer. So <laughs> y'all have that in front of you. Um, so just. To begin with, the definition per the uh, zoning ordinance of a flag lot means a lot where frontage to a public street is provided via a narrow strip of land forming a pole or stem to the buildable portion of the lot. Uh, minimum development standards for a lot, I'm going to be speaking to AG1. I mean, typically that's where we see the, the flag lots. Um, there's a requirement for 35 feet width at the street, a 15-foot wide pole minimum people do them larger but that's the minimum um, and then the size of the flag it depends on the zoning district um, no minimum size in general for the flag um, but obviously if you have a um, requirement of one acre in AG1 you know that's all going to be proportions you know uh, with between the pole and the rest of the, the property the lot depth um, the structure needs uh, to be within 600 feet of a fire hydrant. Um, this is per um, the fire marshal or um, the homeowner's insurance will be very, very expensive because they won't have access to water. Robin, just a clarification on the size of the flag. If you're in an AG1 area, so you need one One acre, acre yes. Is the flag the one acre or no, is No, it's this, total. It's the total. Right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, I know we uh, reviewed a little bit of this the last meeting. You all asked us asked me to get uh, some more information. Um, so the city of Roswell eliminated in 2014 when they adopted their unified development code. Um, they were finding, well, they required larger lot frontage and therefore eliminated, eliminated flag lots. And I got a message at the last minute um, today from the zoning administrator basically um, they saw that there were too many flag lots being developed in the city and they, you know, the staff felt like that that was, uh, she said there were issues with access, too many driveway cuts. I'm not so sure that that's, whatever, for whatever reason, that's what she said. But also that they just saw there was a plethora, increased number of flag lots occurring in the city. Um, I wasn't able to get any further information from the city of Alpharetta for the exact reasons of eliminating it in 2001. City of Sandy Springs, um, they eliminated in 2017, as I said before, when they adopted their new development code, they did a full rewrite of their zoning ordinance pretty um, 
massive. Um, and they, re they required minimum road frontage of 100 feet for each new lot depending on the new, not non, the new zoning district. Um, why? And uh, the director, the community development director there said they created um, awkward lots and allow the development of more parcels. Um, Sandy Springs wanted to make the lot splits and developments difficult in an attempt at preserving more of the natural landscape and allowing for less development, preserving the protected neighborhoods. And lastly, um, just Johns Creek still permits flag lots. Um, so it was asked about um, how many flag lot developments are under review. Right now we have one. Uh, it's uh, with three lots, which that's usually what it is, um, with approximately two acres for each lot. It's on Hopewell Road um, below the new, um, or the reincarnated historic store that's now oh, yeah. called Bloom. Um, I did not do any further auditing of the minor plat, so this is the same information we had last um, time, but um, in review, uh, since 2017, uh, there was one uh, done in 2017, fairly large lot uh, configuration. Uh, there were three flag lot developments in 18 and four in 19 and two in 2020. Um, so with that said, it was also asked to look at um, the number of potential lots that could be developed in the future as, um, as, as flag lots. Um, so we have in front of you, I thought, you know, if you guys get bored at night, you can whip out this map and impress your wife and say, wow, honey, what are you doing, you know, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> you go to Miss Valentine's Day already. <laughs> yeah. So I did give you each your own so you could um, look at it. Um, so in explanation, the red is parcels that are in a size of between three and five acres. Um, some of them are within subdivisions. Uh, so for instance, over off the Highway 9 area, there is a subdivision called the Five Acres, and it's literally called Five Acres because all the lots are required to be five acres. It's R2 with conditions mm -hmm. of minimum size of five acres. Um, there are some other lots. Uh, so Summit Road, they have, it's Summit Road is a gravel road. It's kind of central, lower central of, um, in the city and they have very large lots as well so some of those show up but that's a gravel road so you would um, and it's already a subdivision uh, so you just have to kind of look at it to see that even though there's a fair amount of three to five acre lots they're not necessarily all up um, to be subdivided but nonetheless it does show a lot of I would say independent lots that are potential uh, to be subdivided into one, three um, acre, or three one acre flag lots. Um, as we go on, uh, we divided, and we did this more um, viewing uh, than uh, having GIS create it, but if you look at um, the bubbles or the uh, purple lavender flag lots, typically were between three and five acres and then the blue bubbles were flag lots with more than five acres. And then the more important ones, uh, or what you might be curious about, are flag lots less than three acres um, with the green bubbles. Um, so this is just a graphic representation of what's out there um, currently. And um, also what's interesting too, it's pretty obvious where um, the platted subdivisions are, so you get a, a feeling for how much of the city has already been developed in a major subdivision, not necessarily. Um, and, and then you can see the larger lots that are still available, um, hopefully, to, to preserve in some way or another. have any questions and then I think Bob wanted to come up and ma make a couple comments as well before we started uh, 
for discussion. So Robin, do you have, I, I, I'll have to assess your How many like lots got areas in red, which are three to five So acres, I think there's about 650 of those red lots. Lots, but many, like I said, many, some of them are already within a subdivision. So, um, you know, you're looking at possibly maybe, you know, I don't know, three to four hundred lots that could be subdivided um, into flag lots, because some of them are already within a platted subdivision. This is a crazy question. I don't, I don't know if you'd even know this, but how many? flag lots were because of the family wanted to subdivide it for family members. I have no idea. I couldn't start to say, yeah. Uh... Bob, coming up. Good evening. Good evening. I know most of you know me. I know all of you from CPAC. Um, so this, this, this topic really came up and derived from CPAC. It, it was driven through CPAC, and, and I think when CPAC got together, they kind of looked at it and said, geez, you know, what do we need to do to really look at future land use and how the development patterns are occurring and what's going to happen, what are we trying to achieve in Milton from a land use perspective? And this is a very important topic because when we look at land use, we say, <laughs> what is the council and the community and CPAC really trying to achieve? We're trying to achieve large lot incentives, large lot developments. So I'd like to report on that. I would tell you tonight that I've been working with all the developers and they're coming in. We just did another one, 20 acres this week uh, outside the manor. He came in, he wanted to do single lot, you know, single one acre lot subdivisions. We worked with him, showed him all the incentives and he turned around and said, Bob, you know what? I'm, I'm joining the three acre group. The incentives are good. It allows me, I actually show them how to do the subdivision, how it's going to benefit them, how it's going to look. When we give them the vision, they're, they're gravitating to it. So almost, that's like the third one that we've just done in the last two weeks. So those are the larger ones, the 15s, the 20s. Those, those are coming in. Even the trophy club came in and said, Bob, we'll do the fives. That's, that's another huge one. And we actually increase the limit to as many as you want to do it this way so that we'd give even more incentive on the three acre plus large lot incentives. So it's really been working. <coughs> now, pattern that I showed you at CPAC was that it's kind of a checkerboard. So we have these subdivisions and then we have these smaller lots in between. And that is what makes Milton so unique. No other city has developed that way. So we're really kind of a unique, the, the, the problem is that if we start filling in all those little lots, all those little reds that Robin's showing you on these plans, that all the, the subdivisions are going to start blending one into the next. You're, you're not going to see those gaps of farms and large lots. Now, price of land is going up, going up considerably. People are saying, geez, I have a four-acre track. Somebody knocks on their door and says, listen, you can get four lots. Wait, but I only got like 60 feet of frontage. It doesn't matter because we can, you know, we can do it. We could figure out a way to get you more lots or 100 feet, 120 feet of frontage. You normally wouldn't get it because if you have frontage, then you don't need a flag lot. Flag lot reduces it down to 35 for the physical frontage. So what is it? it's under 100 feet. 100 feet is not even one lot. You know, we're trying to say you have one lot at 100 feet, right? See, if you have 100 feet of frontage, you're normally only going to have one lot. Now I'm, all of a sudden I'm going to throw three lots. I mean, you know, and the price of the land is skyrocketing. People are telling me they're going for over 
$1,000 an acre when you subdivide. That's huge. So the incentive is there. The pressure is there is what I'm saying from the outside community. They're coming in and they're saying, look, you know, I might as well take them down. And I think the large lot incentive is really saving the bigger lots. 20 acres, I kind of subdivide them. I get them into these nice large lots that look like, you know, mini farms. Some people say they want to go equestrian. But on these smaller ones, they go down to one acre because that's what it does. And we incentivize it. I actually tell you if you do a flag lot, through a minor plot process, I'll speed it up. You won't even have to wait. I can do it quickly, administratively. We can get it done fast. So we, we did bring this to, from CPAC, we did bring it to council. We said, look, you know, neighboring cities have already, already eliminated this because of these problems. And here we are, Milton, we're looking to do larger lots, right, Milton? And, and we still have it. And people are taking advantage of it. And they might take more advantage because the prices are going up. Things are getting tighter. So as the lands start to shrink and the availability, they start looking for more opportunity. That opportunity is out there. They're going to start grabbing it more and more. Bring it to council. We did, which is what CPAC directed me to do. Bob, bring it to council. We did. Council said, listen, we want to make sure that we vet it out. Bring it back to Planning Commission. And you guys think about it. And that's why we're making these presentations to y'all, to make sure that we can vet this out and look at it. Now, if somebody really wants their child or their spouse or their grandparent or their parents to be on the site, there's other ways we could do that. We could do it through accessory dwellings, which we do. If they have enough frontage, they can just carve out another lot. But to sit there and say, okay, we're going to allow all these one-acre lots because we feel like families are moving in, that's really not the case. We're not, we're not getting a whole bunch of family compounds. And if we were, then we'd come back to you all and say, look, the demand is really strong for that. We'll figure out another way around it. You know, maybe we'll figure out another zoning or another way to, to get through that process so we, we wouldn't discourage that. But normally, most of these are just getting developed. People are selling them, and they're going, they're going out there. So it's, I just wanted to bring this all to you to say that it's very important. I'm, I'm actually monitoring and working with the developers every single day. I see multiple developers per day. They're all coming in. Land is very expensive. Things are hot. Money's cheap. And people are developing. Okay? The, the price of... Commodities are going up because there's such a great demand for them because people are doing it. So the price of lumber is going up and all. But people are still doing it because money's cheap. And they're coming in and they're saying, listen, we want to do this. So I'm, I'm seeing slowly the erosion of exactly what CPAC is telling me to preserve. Preserve Milton. Preserve the, the visual aesthetic of Milton. But then it comes in and I say, geez, you know, how, how can I do that when... On the other end, they say, look, this is as of right. You can do it this way. So it's, I just want to bring all of this to the board, let you know the importance of this. And I think it's, it's a serious issue. I think it's going to impact the visual character of Milton over time. And I think it's going to incentivize people the wrong way. We're trying to incentivize larger lots, and now we're taking three-acre lots and incentivizing them to do one-acre lots. It's, it's actually working totally opposite of what I'm trying to incentivize. People are coming in and saying, wait, you know, now, which way do I go? They're sort of looking confused. And we have a lot of people coming in. I have people coming in from California, from out, out of state. They're not local. These people are coming in saying, geez, you know, we love the way Milton looks. You know, what do we need to do? And a lot of them are looking for larger farms, and we're trying to get them into f larger farms. We're trying to incentivize equestrian uses. And, and actually have real equestrian style. We're trying to do branding. Everything that CPAC has directed us to do as staff, we're already initiating and trying to implement. But this is one factor, I think, that's actually working counter to what you all have asked me to do. So that's why we're trying to bring it up. Um, we didn't, you know, support any moratoriums or anything, but we do want to vet it out here and then, uh, you know, bring it back to council with a recommendation from this board 
saying which way you'd like to go. So if you have any questions. Well, let's just, let's just take, take your last statement. You want something to go back to the council. Yes. Um, what do you need us to do? Well, I'd like you to make a recommendation and that, that we could bring back to council. You could say, okay, Bob, you know, we're going to take this up and say, okay, as a board, we're going to recommend the elimination, say, or the preservation of, or the modification of the, f the flag lot provision. And then we would then take that back to council and say, this is the recommendation from the planning commission, which is what they asked us to do. And then it will be up to council to ultimately say, okay, you know, we, we, we'd like to go in this direction at a, work at a workshop meeting. And then Robin would then do whatever text amendment she needed to do in order to achieve that, that vision. The, um, it, it seems from what Robin said today and uh, some reading that I've been doing on flag lots, um, that my impression there are basically three levers that you have. One is just say, no more. Mm -hmm. Uh, another is the frontage that you, uh, that you brought up. Perhaps it was Robin. And the third is uh, distance between curb cuts that I've seen in some place in South Carolina, Pine Ridge, South Carolina. They modified the, the, uh, the curb cuts, I think. Um, it strikes me, well, let me ask you, of those levers, are there, is there one that's um, more effective than the others, and and okay. there may be other levers that I didn't enumerate there too. But um. so the the curb cut, we allow one driveway. Uh, that some places you have to have a curb cut every 35 feet for yeah. the, for that access. We allow one common driveway, and then in fact that driveway doesn't even have to be over those flags. So sometimes you can actually have the flag lot come out to a street and have your driveway approach totally off another street or another. Uh, subdivision so it doesn't necessarily have to even be on the road the road just gives it road frontage which makes the lot legal okay so that one I don't think is very strong uh, I think just you know that if we eliminate it then we de-emphasize de it de-incentivize it tell them it's no longer available it will preserve those lots because the people can no longer if you have frontage and you meet all the AG1, regular AG1 um, guidelines, you, you, you can do it. So if you have a lot that's 600 feet wide and you want to have three lots, you can subdivide it, right? Because it's 100 foot a lot. So you, you could just say, okay, Bob, I'm going to have 100 or 200, 200, and 200, or whatever you, you know, want to do. You could still do that. You still get your three lots, but you can't do the flag. Right. The but flag would limit it. Um, that would down require to changing the code. Because in the code, there's a minimum frontage of 35 foot for AG1. That would be the that would be the lever that you'd be pulling. Well, I, I still want to maintain the 35 foot frontage. Uh, we, we, we would rewrite it because if you're on a cul-de-sac, that's how I do the 35. So I'm not going to eliminate that. What we would do is just write it in to say that we're not doing um, flight lots. We would write it out in such a way that you would no longer be allowed to do eliminate that. And all these, the, the potential for all these that are in red, if you no longer have flag lots, they can still be developed as long as they meet the other minimum frontage requirements. That's correct. As long as they meet the AG1 frontage requirements, absolutely. I mean, we wouldn't want to take that away. Whatever that is, that's the right, right? If so if they have, you know, the correct road frontage and the correct uh, gross square footage for the lot, which is minimum an acre in our case, um, yeah, you'd be able to subdivide it. And a lot of people do. A lot of people come in and say, Bob, you know, we'll just make these. Say, okay, you know, and even those, we're trying to save those, but we couldn't stop them. I mean, people want to do them. We say that they're okay. But they've got to have the minimum 100 feet yes. frontage. Right. right. And the flag is obviously 35. Right. It, this is taking somebody's lot who, who really doesn't 
and have a lot of frontage. Say they have 100 frontage. So they made a lot out of it. But it's four acres, three acres. Then they can say, look, you know what? If it's three acres, I can make three lots out of it now. Wait, wait, wait. Yeah, they can make sure that. Right, you would be able to do 35, 35. You can do 35, 35, 35. Then you can do that, yeah. Then this, this way you would, you would preserve that three or four acre lot, which is what we're trying to do. We're mm -hmm. trying to create and incentivize these three, three acre lots, right? We pick three acres as the, as the size. Because the 10 would have been, then it really would have said, geez, you know, it doesn't, it's not really applicable to these smaller ones. But we're trying to preserve them. So why would we then preserve the threes and incentivize them, in fact, really incentivize them, and then turn around and say to somebody, all right, you happen to have a three, now I'm going to give you more incentive to just go one, 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 <laughs> and, and subdivide that. It's, it's almost like counterproductive of what we're trying to achieve from CPAC, I think. So that, that's why I'm bringing it back to you. I wanted to come tonight because I said, you know, it's important for you all to hear. Tomorrow night we'll be at CPAC again, and we'll be talking about, about you know, zonings and land use and all of these items. But I think it's really, really important because this is one element that I think really would have a big impact overall, and, and it, would, it would demonstrate that we're really incentivizing because otherwise people look at me and go, Bob, but you know, you're asking me to do threes, but yet you, you know, I do flags and do ones. I mean, it's sort of, and if somebody has a big flag and say they have um, 12 acres, and they say, okay, we're going to do three, four acre lots. Well, then you just have the large lot provision. And, and I let you do exactly that. You don't have to make all these little flags and just go right in. I mean, that was the whole energy behind the, the, the large lot. So that we would do it. So if you have six and you want to do two threes, you can do exactly this. You don't have to do a flag line anymore. The flag line's only applying for people who have smaller lots. You know, three acre lots, and they want to get three houses on three acres, but they don't have road frontage. So now we're just stacking houses deep instead of on front. So a little confusion. Okay. Um, the H1 says the minimum lot frontage be 35 foot, and you said you wouldn't. Take care, eliminate that because of cul-de-sac. Uh, I said, uh, the cul yeah, I will rewrite it to make sure that we can take it out. But on cul-de-sac lots, when you're doing an, an AG1 subdivision, I still want to maintain that, that provision for that because otherwise you'd lose the, the houses that are pie shape right. on, on the cul-de-sac. I think that's, that I wouldn't want, that. I don't think it's the intent to do that. The intent is to remove the flag lot provision that actually says you're allowed to do flag lots under uh, a minor plot. How do you that's what incentivize we the larger lots? How do you incentivize the larger lots? Uh, council's already approved all the incentives for the larger lots. So what they do is they say, normally you have to have road frontage, and the, one of the biggest ones is you could do a driveway and then have legal road frontage on that driveway. Instead of a 50-foot right away, now you can do a 20-foot minimum driveway. So right there, you get quite a bit. You don't have to do curb and gutter. You do rural cross-sections. Uh, we don't have to have street lights. We don't have to have sidewalks. Uh, we don't have to have a detention bond. Because when you have three lots, you do detention on the lot. Water quality right on the lot. So now you, you've eliminated that whole pond. So when people are looking at it, they go, Bob, the cost of putting in a roadway, putting in the lights, putting in the curb and gutter, building a detention pond, building all the infrastructure in the road, right? the drainage to get to the detention pond. When we put that all together financially, there's a lot of money that the developer has to put in before they start selling lots. The other way, there's very little money to be put in, and then they can turn around and say, okay, now I didn't put any money in, and I'm selling lots. And it's a, it's a minor but, uh, process that goes quicker rather than uh, the longer provision on, uh, on, the, on the regular you know, subdivision rates. It takes them much longer. So the process is faster. They've given incentives. They still have to meet fire code. So it's fire truck access, fire hydrants, and things like that. But it just makes it a lot easier. We have provisions on, on a subdivision range right? that they have to be 50 feet uh, away from you know, an abutting residential property line, like an abutting AG1 property line. But this one, now you have driveway, that's not going to be applicable. So some of these just kind of work for, for, for folks. It just really helps. Them out. You have less traffic, less diesel lanes, so all of these things. We have less lots. So with less lots, you're not tripping all of those other requirements that normally you would. There's a whole lot of 
infrastructure that's removed, and that, that's all cost up front for our developers. So a lot of development occurs when you have a developer, right, subdivides the property, creates the lots, then the builders come in and stop building. We do have some national ones that do both, but they even national ones like Taylor Morrison, they're working right down here, they have two divisions. They have the development division, they have the building division. So first, when I'm working with them, I work with the development division, just like a developer would come in and do all of that. Then I don't see those people anymore. A new group comes in and says, we're the building division. We're now going to build it. So even the large you know, uh, national builders still treat it as developer, builder. And, and that's just, it's kind of funny the way to do that. And it's, it's just, and, and sometimes it's really, really great. Uh, I wish I could show you guys everything I do. Sometimes they're even finding amongst themselves. Because the, the developer says, well, I could show, you know, that I'm doing all of these slots and they're not putting a whole lot of money into it. And then, you know, so everybody wants to show a profit on it, a division, so to speak. And when we did the one right here in Red Apple, uh, we made them do quite a bit of infrastructure, uh, pond and the bridges and, and things like that. So even when we're looking at like the trophy club, we're asking them to, to make all roads look real nice, all cross sections, any bridges look really nice, like bridges. I try to get them to do a cover bridge. <laughs> I have somebody to do a cover bridge. Uh, nobody took me up on that yet. Uh, public works will probably, they always fit me on covered bridges, but I just thought it looked really nice to have a covered bridge. No room for the fire truck. No room for the fire truck. I, I, I've heard it all, I, I, but I'm trying. I, we, I, I will tell you, you know, I want to let this, this board know that we really work very hard to really create a great developments in the city of Melbourne, to really look when people come in at their roadways, how they're creating them. You know, sometimes they, they, they just look kind of haphazard, or, or they're just straight. Like, I look at it and say, you know, let's put some curves in it, because slightly curved roads really have a much nicer aesthetic. Um, what, what terminates the road? Is there a visual at the end of the roads? You know, when you really want to do something, you have something nice, a vista, trees, something other than just you know, a pond, a detention pond or something at the end of the road. It just doesn't. And, and when people go back and it's not putting the, their performance together as far as their financial model, they come back and go, Bob, you're right. And instead of selling these houses for 400000 we're getting a million eighty. We're getting a million and a half. We're getting three million. So developers come in and say, Bob, I thought I was going to get 1.6. The guy knocked on my door, told me $3 million cash. It's closed in seven days, he says, you know what, it's gone. Yeah. Taylor Morrison, they turned around and said, you know what, we were thinking high fours, mid fives, they're selling for 800000 And he said, that's starting. These, that brave townhouses that are right here, uh, the first one sold before we even built it at 980, and then, now we told me that they'd be selling the middle unit for over a million. And then they'll probably come in and add more. And those three that you see there. So the, what I'm saying is the prices, and that's because when we do it, when we do these developments, we sit with them and really, really study what they're doing and say, look, this is Milton. The standard, the bar is much higher than you want it to be. And most of them fight it initially a little bit and say, oh, well, what are you doing? It costs me nobody wants to spend money. But when they go back and look at the formula and what I'm telling them, they realize that they're really going to sell them for a whole lot more. And Sell them quicker because in real estate, it's not just you know what you're selling them for, but how fast you can, you can get on the street. And they, they just looked at me today and said, They have 1,200 people, they have 46 lots. <laughs> and he looked at me and said, My prices are going up because you know, you're going up until, until some of it drops. And this is what this is the way the market is. They're even going to builders saying they want more, and that's because they we just design really nice roads. You'll see they're all curved. And that's what we can do with large lot incentives. We could split roads. Like the other day I met with somebody and said, look, why don't you take the road and let's split it and put some landscape balance in the middle. Uh, let's make loops at the end and the hammerhead. Let's really get into design. And let's really make this thing something special. We started looking at the, the 20 acres right outside of, um, of, of uh, Manor. He looked at me and said, gee, Bob, let's look at the topography. You know, where how we get great businesses and views. I said, you, you, all of a sudden now you're talking a lot premium. You know, 
know, you, you start in these lots of, you know, normally cities don't talk to people that way. They come in, and, all right, let's open up a book. You know, what does the book say? We got 30 feet, you got 30, you got two things, you got two. This is what John Creek does, you know, and then the people are looking and say, but, you know, the real estate already is not doing it as well. It's doing good, but not like Milton. We did our economics. So you start in CPAC. We were the bluest of blue. That was like the, nobody was close to you, sir. Right? I mean, we had a consultant give us the thing. And the reason we've been doing that is because for the last 10, 12 years, we've been developing Milton. We've been really, really studying Milton and working with it from a placemaking perspective. What are we going to look at? What is, what is the vision of Milton 20 years? This is what we do in CPAC. Looking 20 years ahead. And now we're starting to look at things even more carefully in CPAC. And I really like your input. Every time we go there and you all give me input, you might think we're just sitting there. But I'm back in the back room and leaving the meeting. And okay, this is where they want me to be. We need to do it. We have their support. Let's do more. And when I talk to people, I go, listen, man, I just had a CPAC meeting last week. And the whole board is really pushing for this. Looking at one developer now, I'm like, look, I want a visitor center. You know, we, we don't have a visitor center. So I'm interested in a museum. I look at other people and say, listen, any, any interest in a museum? Let's get, or just in case, right? Somebody's going to stand up and say, hey, oh, all right, I'll do it. I'll do a visitor center. I already got somebody saying they'll do a visitor center for them. Now, you know, that's kind of a nice little, like, like thing. We, we, we talked about amphitheaters, right? Everybody said we need more visual arts, performing arts, we need more amphitheaters. So I look at the developer and say, listen, the code says you have to have open space. Why aren't we creating more of these kind of open spaces? Live, work, play. We're working with developers now in, in Deerfield. We've amassed 38 years and working with them. Hopefully it works. Maybe it doesn't. But, but we're truly doing a work with play in exact performance with what CPAC had told me that they are looking for in that zone. So we are really following through. And, and, and implement everything that you all are telling me you want as a vision. For tonight, I will tell you that flag lots is something we should take very serious. We should look at it and we should eliminate or de emphasize it to the point where nobody really wants to use it. That's what I'm going to say. Probably preaching to the choir here. I know. Uh, I think <laughs> because in CPAC, we heard your, your remarks meetings ago, I guess it was. Um, you know, I was fantastically in support of the notion of looking at, at, uh, at flight lots and seeing what we can do to the character of uh, uh, Milton as a player. So, um, uh, I, I'm sort of reaching out to try to determine what the next step is. And as I see it from your remarks, um, uh, you'd like to go back and pray. Um, ordinance, I suppose, mm -hmm. uh, that would be presented to us at a uh, point in the near future for us. Yes. And, then, and then take that to council. But uh, I would just want to make sure that we're crafted by doing it. So if there was some discussion that says, yes, Bob, we would like to eliminate flag glass, then we will sit down with an eye and we will go through and craft that language. If you, if you were, I think it would probably help yeah. some sort of a guidance, right? If, if you want an official act of this council to ask for staff to present something to you, yes, it should be in the form of a motion. Yeah. That'd be the motion, yeah. Let's, well, so okay. we'll go in order, I guess, just to make sure nobody else has any questions for Bob. Thank you so much, Bob. Open the floor up for any discussion or motion. Make a motion that we find information recommend. I go Would that be asking staff to present a, an ordinance amendment to accomplish that? Accomplish eliminating flag loss. Is that the goal? To get? The next step would be for staff to do craft something craft it. Right. and bring it to you, to which you would then recommend to the council approval. I'll reiterate the motion. The motion is that 
that you recommend in the staff craft an ordinance that would actually eliminate flag lots for the city of Milton. That's the motion on the floor. Anybody? We got a second. Any discussion? Yeah. I, Bob, can you, you say that there's very little request for family members to have a cutout? That's the only thing that kind of bugs me. Is, is if I've been Milton for many years and, and I've got you know, kids, I want to give them. I want to give them the land as well as giving them a place to put the house, not just have them stick their house on my, my lot. Type of deal. Is, is there a way to, to to protect that? And what you're asking for? Bobby, you might just come up. I'm popping those things out every day. Um, it, it's a little difficult. I mean, we have one one person coming in with a, actually with a, a subdivision request, and they're proposing to do it with CUP. Uh, and their their notion is, oh, I have a family, and we have six people, and we want to maintain six people on the six spots. Um, but there's no way to really guarantee that they're going to be there forever and use it. People, you know, if you do something very custom, there's no way to monitor for that because somebody says tomorrow, you know, I, I, I come in, I want a flag lot, I'm going to say, listen, you know, listen, I got two kids, I want three lots, flag lots, my, my family. And once I build it, a day later, I turn around and say, you know what, my kids don't want to live here. I will tell you, my daughter moved away, she went to Tennessee, and my son moved to Savannah, and he moved to Oklahoma, and then my daughter said, oh, I want to come back home, so she came back home from Tennessee. <laughs> so, you know, somebody in Oklahoma, somebody, you don't know what's going to happen. Like, people just kind of float all over the place. I could see it if you want like an in, in law suite, you know, like an accessory apartment, then you can do it. But if you want to say there, Bob, you know, say I want to subdivide property with my kids, let's do it in conformance with the, the AG1 regulations, the subdivision regs. I don't have to do a flag for it. I guess I got one question. Um, if we eliminate those, is that going to have any economic impact on the current owners, the value of their property? You know, something three that thought it was worth more okay. a flag lot versus I, not. I used to think it did, but all the feedback I'm getting from the development community is on the three acre lots is that the three acre lots are selling for more than the three one acre lots. And I found that kind of hard to believe. Because they said to me, gee, Bob, you know, we're selling these lots. So like Trophy Club, they're advertising those lots at, you know, over a million dollars. Five acre lots, over a million dollars. Um, to be just the lot? It's just the lot. <laughs> yes. So they, they, now they're telling me that the lots are going up over close to 300000 for a lot. And then I said, geez, I really would like larger lots. So then the, this is the property that's just around the fire station 42. So he came in, he's got land, and I'm talking to him because he's given me an easement for the septic. So he's a nice guy and said he'd give the city some easements for our septic system. And he's going to use it as a mail kiosk area and that kind of thing. So he didn't have any problem with it. Nice guy. And I said to him, I said, well, you know, what's the difference between the ones and the threes? He said, I'll be honest with you, I'm selling the threes for more money than the ones because the demand is there. The demand is there. So it's actually a stronger demand for the threes than the ones because everybody really wants the threes. Well, that's good to hear because I was just good, personally, right? personally wrestling with, you know, are we affecting some yeah, of these? Yeah, I, I was worried about that too when I looked at it. And I think that's a good, a good question to ask. Well, no, my only comment is I think you know, it's incumbent on us to provide the tools like the CPAC, right? The tools to get where we want to be as Milton. I think we all have the same vision of Milton all this together. And I think it's incumbent on us to provide those tools for them. So I, you know, I support this 100%. Yeah. Anybody else have any other questions, discussion for the motion on the floor? Okay, hearing none, I'm going to go ahead and take a vote on the motion. Uh, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Anybody opposed? Okay. Motion passes.
Thanks again, Bob, for coming. Yeah. And any, any other items you got, Robin? Um, like I said, just be prepared next week. Uh, next month, we'll have a, a pretty beefy uh, agenda. So, Okay. All right. Do I hear a motion? To- adjourn. All right. Motion to adjourn. A second. Second. Second by Mr. Gilbert. All, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Anybody opposed? All right. Motion adjourned. Thank you all.